Hello and welcome to the On The Whistle podcast. My name is Alistair Howarth, your host for this AFCON preview series. And today we have got one of the big ones. Yes, that is right. South Africa. We call ourselves the biggest bry in Africa. And that is for a reason. We love South African football. We've got far too many South Africans involved with this podcast. And two of them join me to talk about Bafana Bafana. Ferdos, Munda and Courtney Fries join me to talk all things Bafana Bafana, including the what's going on with Lyle Foster and, and his decision not to turn out for Bafana, as well as how that might impact the squad and some of the issues behind the scenes in Safa. I hope you enjoy it as much as we did. Guys, this is the one and only preview podcast that we're doing where we've had more than one guest as, as as speaking, because none of us are guests here. I would say even less than one, because we've got two two of our normal panelists, normal gang on the on the whistle. Ferdos and Courtney. Ferdos and Courtney, how are you, how are you guys doing? We couldn't have one without the other. Zane made his excuses, tried to tried to get away. We couldn't pin him down. But to be fair, I think two South Africans is more than enough to previous Africa. I can't deal with having a third one. How are you guys doing today? Yeah, very well. Thank you. And you've actually got one South African in South Africa. So uh, that's a bonus. I've been back for about three weeks after the, the Cricket World Cup in, in India, which was an experience of its own. And yeah, ending off a, a year, I think, which um, uh, South African sport has just you know surged back into relevance, actually. Um, Alistair, I was just writing some of my year-end reviews before we came on the pod. And I think 2023, when we look back, it's a year that we'll see that South African sport, especially cricket, which, as you know, is my main beat. Of course, the Springboks, and we're going to take every opportunity to say Springboks, uh, won the fourth, uh, their fourth Rugby World Cup. And, and I think the footballers, thanks largely to Banyana Banyana, but um, just made me look up Bafana's record, and uh, they went for a long time unbeaten. I think they said 14 games, which we didn't, I didn't even know that. <laughs> so uh, we're, we're a relevant sporting country once again, and I think 2024 is going to be a really big year. Well, Ferdos, from, from someone who's happy to be in South Africa to someone who's very happy not to be in South Africa, Courtney, how are you, how are you doing enjoying the, the miserable Essex weather? Oh, well, <laughs> firstly, good morning to the two of you. It's lovely to see you both again. <sighs> I'm happy you're both safe during this festive season. I'll just say to you, the weather is perfect. It's 12 <laughs> degrees. It's not raining. It's cool. There's no mosquitoes, no flies, uh, no air conditioners needed, nothing. The beers stay outside. You don't need a fridge. So <laughs> a bonus as well. Um, <laughs> just following on from what those has just said, yes, South Africa has just come back into a huge element of relevance. The Springboks, four, four times Rugby World Cup champions, in one of the most difficult sports out there. The cricketers, with the latest uh, winning um, in Pretoria, an innings victory against the mighty India, goodness gracious, with Vera Kohli in the team, with some big hitters in the side. Uh, I, I, I'm just so pleased with how South Africa is doing on a sporting level. And then you, you cannot forget, as for those brought to our relevance a bit earlier, what's going on with Banyana Banyana, a fantastic outfit, experienced players. Um, sports is looking good. And one more thing I'm going to add to it. I'm actually positive about Bafana Bafana going to the AFCON. <laughs> well, that is that is enough cricket, enough rugby. I've given you your guys your slots to, to lord it over us, how good South Africa are at sports. We're here to talk about Bafana Bafana. And yeah, it, it's interesting for those because... You know, Courtney is saying for once he's actually feeling encouraged about South Africa because I think the narrative around South African football for the men's football for the last three or four years has just been misery kind of since since 2019 AFCON didn't qualify for the last AFCON. You know, th you know, there's been a lot of tension with Hugo Bruce, who seems to have done quite well, but also, you know, is, is exposing a lot of the issues that South, South African football has. There's obviously loads of issues behind the scenes in, in, in Safa. But as you said, you are almost surprised to, to, to see that South Africa had actually gone on the longest unbeaten run of any African side until they, until they lost to Rwanda in the latest World Cup qualifiers. What is the mood in South Africa coming into the AFCON? Yeah, Alistair, you know, I've got to say, when Courtney said he's optimistic, I thought, gosh, I think he might be the only South African to say that because there, there is no mood. It's just that our, our sporting psyche is taken up with all sorts of other things. You know, we don't have to mention all the other teams again, but Bafana Bafana have been perennial disappointments. And I think people are just used to seeing, oh, okay, they, they haven't made it again. They've lost again. They're, they're not up there again. And qualifying for AFCON in itself was a fairly big deal. 
but uh, maybe not as well received or as as well celebrated as it should have been. And now that they're heading off, and it's not long now, you know, we're two weeks away from the start of the tournament. Really, the sense I get is that people are not that interested. There's so much else going on for them to be interested in. We've had a rough week in the PSL with that Morocco Swallows game being uh, cancelled. And, and I think the general pessimism around South African football, and as you say, especially men's football, is extremely high. So in in one sense, I guess that's a good thing because when you fly in under the radar and you were telling us off air before we, we started the podcast that other countries are saying, oh, hang on, watch out for them. Maybe they've got something. You know, they're going in basically with nothing to lose. If they come back having been knocked out in the group stage, all they'll say is, oh, well, there they go again kind of thing. So maybe it's good for them. I also think part of the reason, and and you know, not to be too critical on this, but part of the reason we don't get enough hype around Bafana Bafana is that our media is really, really struggling. So, you know, we don't have a lot of media houses that are covering football critically. Uh, we don't have uh, any kind of real... Um, I would say in-depth kind of look, you know, what you're seeing if you do kind of brief Googling is the headline grabs, you know, a few hundred words here or there. You're not really seeing anything that's taking us in. And I think what what Bafana Bafana lacks, and sorry to bring this up again, is what the Springboks and the Proteas have, which is that that they somehow reach the fans. You know, the Springboks do it too much because we had that whole Chasing the Sun series on on, uh, pay television, which honestly, it was a bit of an orgy, actually. But we're not seeing Bafana Bafana reach out and say to people, we also want to play for 60 million South Africans. We also represent all of you. In fact, we do it better than the Springboks and the Proteus because we look like you. And they just, I don't know, they're just not getting that public support. I hope that they go to AFCON and they do well and that they qualify for 2026 and that we start to think, oh, hang on, here's a team we can get behind again. Because we know that the the best ambassadors in our country are our sports people. Everyone else, besides maybe some musicians, are not worth talking about. So, um, yeah, I hope the mood changes. Yeah, absolutely. And and I think one of the things we talked about, about, you know, South African football is, is how badly run Safa is, you know, the, the lack of support that the players get, the, the lack of infrastructure, despite, you know, South Africa, and, you know, in terms of the African context being one of the most, most wealthy nations, obviously the PSL is the, the wealthiest league in the continent. And you have, you know, on the PSL, yes, I know Chiefs and Pirates aren't doing brilliantly, but Chiefs made it to, to the CAF Champions League final a few years. You know, Mamelodi Sundowns look like the best the best team on the continent, bar maybe al Ahly. But one of the things that I think has also caused the negativity is I think fans have been really surprised with how candid Hugo Bruce has been, you know, because he's come in and he, he's, he's, he's not pulled any shots, you know, or pulled any punches. He's been saying, you know, this is poorly run. This is, you know, we've not got the budget. We've not got the training sorted. He, he, and one of the things he's brought up about the AFCON was, you know, he only selected 23 players uh, out of the allocated 27. When he was asked about it, you know, he was frank. He said, yes, it's in part because I like a smaller squad, but he said also restricted by, by our budget. I mean, when, when I was interviewing Jovita Kanjumba from, from Namibia, she was saying, you know, similar things. Oh, we, we still don't know where they're going to stay hotel wise in Cote d'Ivoire. But that, that kind of makes sense for Namibia. You know, this is not a big sporting nation, you know, financially isn't a very wealthy nation. What does it say about South African football, about Bafana, that they're having the exact same issues that they, we can't even bring four players to Cote d'Ivoire because they don't have the money for it? Yeah, it, it's a disaster. And it, it's not just what it says about Bafana and about Safa. It's what it says about South Africa. So we are a country where most things go wrong because of corruption and because of poor expenditure of money. You know, we've got money. This country is rich and and very wealthy and things go wrong because the money isn't spent in the right places. I think Safa and what's happening at Bafana Bafana is a great metaphor for, for that in general. Just to give you some background, South Africa pulled out of the hosting of the 2027 Women's World Cup. And they issued the statement saying, we've decided instead we're going to focus on 2031. The backstory to that is that they couldn't get the government guarantees to host the World Cup. And in order to make the bid, you've got to get government guarantees. It's an absolute disaster and an embarrassment that South Africa, a country that has hosted Rugby World Cups, a Men's Football World Cup, and this year, Women's Cricket World Cup and the Netball World Cup, cannot get it together to put in a bid for a Women's Football World Cup. When really Africa needs a tournament like this, it it would do wonders for the women's game. So that aside, we've also seen other financial problems this year. Banyana Banyana, remember, boycotted that game before the Women's World Cup because the players were unhappy with the pitch that they were given, with the facilities that they were provided with. Then there was a dispute over payment. Now we've seen Bafana Bafana saying that they hadn't been paid for a couple of games as well. In fact, just this morning, a story that the support staff 
did not receive their December salaries, which is really important because that likely includes their bonuses. It's the festive season. We all know that South Africans love to, to you know, have a good time and, and we're all busy in, enjoying and spending all the money that we've made. And they haven't received this. And all these issues are now colliding to take them to an AFCON tournament where they're going in under-resourced. You mentioned, Alistair, that a team like Namibia, it's a great comparison because it's a country of 4 million people you know, which is a fraction of South Africa's 60 odd million uh, and a country there where you would expect there to be a little bit of financial struggle. They're seemingly getting it together in some of the other sporting codes. We saw them at the Rugby World Cup. They played in the Cricket T20 World Cup as well, and they will play again. But South Africa should never be having these problems. They they should be getting sponsors. Bafana Bafana need to be able to um, win the confidence of the big corporate. There's loads of money in this country and you need people to put money into it. So I think, yes, it says something about the state of SAFA, which is diabolical, but it also says something about the state of the country as a whole. And we hope that their performance doesn't do the same. Mm, absolutely. I, at, one of the things I wanted to speak about on the pitch in terms of the kind of issues behind the scenes, and Courtney, I'll bring you you into this, is you know the big, big, big story of, of this team selection, aside from the fact that you don't have the money for those extra four players, is, is the omission of of a certain Lyle Foster, who has, you know, probably been over the last 12 months, 18 months, one of South Africa's best players, obviously doing brilliantly at Burnley, but, you know, hadn't played for a couple months for Burnley because he'd taken time out because of his mental health, said he'd been struggling with depression, um, which I think actually is, is a brilliant story. The fact that, you know, an, an elite athlete is able to, to say that and come out publicly, I think it'll ultimately do a lot for, for kind of mental health awareness and, you know, the way in which we understand the, the demands on, on athletes. But, Courtney, the, you know, Hugo Bruce came out with a lot of comments when he was selecting the squad, essentially saying that he never had the chance to, to, to pick Lyle Foster, which is strange because he's actually come back into the Burnley squad over the last few weeks. He's made the few appearances. He started in that game against Liverpool uh, recently. And, you know, but he said he called Vincent Company and Vincent Company said there's no chance he's not coming. Uh, the medical team wrote a letter to Safa saying he's not coming. And even he himself wrote a letter a few weeks ago saying he's not coming. You know, how. What is your take on kind of, on the one hand, obviously, you know, we don't know what's going on with Lyle. It's really important that he's getting the support that he needs. And if that's coming from Burnley, that's important. But at the same time, do you understand a certain frustration, particularly from Bruce's side, that it's the sense of, well, if he's well enough from a medical perspective to play for Burnley, and, you know, he said one of the biggest issues in terms of his depression has in particularly been moving to Europe and being alone, you know, surely coming and being back home with Bafana and then traveling to Cote d'Ivoire would make a big difference. Obviously, we don't want to make assumptions about the causes of what's going on with him. But, you know, what is your take on on the, the kind of Lyle Foster and Hugo Bruce situation? Well, I think we firstly need to start off by respecting the mental health issue that this guy is going through. Let's start there. Uh, it's not a small thing. He's moved to the country. He's a young guy, moved to this country on his own. Uh, and he's even though he's in a very privileged environment, he misses his niches he has at home in South Africa, which we all understand as we move throughout, out throughout the world. Okay, so let's start there. Um, I can understand Hugo Boss's, Boss's point of view, where he's frustrated that Lyle Foster, who's a fantastic asset to the team, who, has, as Fido spoke about earlier, has taken Bafana Bafana on this extended positive run prior to the tournament, where they've really gone to difficult places. Example, Cope d'Ivoire and got good results, he's been part of that project. So you want one of your biggest hitters who prior to going into this difficult period of his was flying in the Premier League. I'll, I'll say that. I've got him in my fantasy team. He, is, <laughs> he was getting me points. He was doing exceptionally well, <laughs> right? But then you also got to look at it from the Vincent Company point of view. The guy's coming back. You've got to nurture him. You've got to bring him back into the project. There's a long-term project with him. He's just signed a new deal at um, Burnley. I think tread sensitively. So let's leave Lau Foster. He's out, he's out the picture, right? But I feel there's a lot of positivity in South Africa that they can still go into the tournament and make the right type of impact. Everything is against us. Right, everything. If you look at, if you look at some of the negative points that uh, for for those who are speaking about, we're looking at not just Bafana Bafana not being paid. Swallows haven't been paid for three months. Their players haven't been paid. Right? The, 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 there is such a lot of negativity in a country so full of great resources, 
But along with this negativity is a long run of positive results at Hugo Pross, who's been very critical of the PSL, of the player's quality, of the player's ability. He's come out, but he's forged a mentality and a team that is now moving forward. Now, when we talk about Bafana Bafana, some of the positives I've looked at, they assemble on the 4th of January. Great. They've qualified when I didn't think they would qualify. You know how critical I was of the qualification process. We went into a group that was made so easy for us. We struggled to qualify, but now we're there. So we're in this. But look at the teams in South Africa. Sundowns, Supersport, Stellenbosch have won a trophy. The uh, Please remind me for those. Uh, um, the Black Label, MTN. Yeah, the, the, yes, the Carling Cup. The Carling Cup. Fantastic achievement to go to Durban, uh, my hometown, and win uh, a trophy. So you, you, you look at these teams all doing well. Then you look at the qualification. Look at the times we're playing in the heat of the game. 8 o'clock, 8 o'clock, 5 p.m. I just think Bafana Bafana have a, a road into the qualifying group. If you look at uh, Hugo Gross's comments, failure would be not to get out of the group, you know? Uh, and I think he's right. He's got to call out on the players. Um, I really wish Lyle Foster could be part of the project. I really wish he could be. But he's not. So we've got to move on. Yeah. Courtney, I just want to come in there, Alistair, just because of, of what Courtney mentioned about uh, why the conditions were such that Lyle Foster couldn't be part of it. So one of the things I read was that Hugo Bross was saying uh, Lyle Foster needed some sort of uh, medical care, although he didn't use those words, but that's how I interpreted it, 24-7. And, and maybe that's, you know, a, a different interpretation of it. I mean, I'm sure he doesn't have someone watching him 24-7, but he obviously needs to have someone on call if that's what he needs. And to me, this asks a question about the resources that Bafana Bafana are provided with, because most professional sports teams now do have, and, and it's the same with national teams in our country, someone on hand, whether it's a mental coach, sometimes they call it a psychologist, if we want to, if you want to go that way, you know, someone, uh, I think the cricketers call it a high performance kind of coach, someone who can deal with that off field side of things. And I think what Hugo Bross's comments told us is that Bafana Bafana don't have that. So they can't provide this environment of comfort that Lyle Foster needs in order to come in and be at his best. And as Courtney said, we do need to have some sort of understanding and respect. It's a very challenging thing that he's gone and done. Um, you know, having lived in, in the UK myself for some time, it's not easy for South Africans to adapt to that environment. It, it sounds very twee and funny, but the, the British winter is a, a very difficult thing to get your head around. It is depressing. It is cold. Um, people are not always the, the friendliest because they're also depressed and cold. And uh, I, I do think it takes a toll on, on a lot of people that we don't speak about because it sounds like a silly thing to complain about, but it's actually not. And maybe that's part of the reason. I mean, we don't know exactly what, what's going on with him. But I, apart from respecting that and saying, OK, he's not available, it does lead us into a discussion of are Bafana Bafana properly resourced? Do they have everything they need to have? You know, playing in, in parts of Africa, like Courtney mentioned, it's difficult and very, very challenging. South African footballers especially, and anybody with a level of privilege, you know, we live a, a very middle class, almost Western lifestyle. And then you go into countries where the environment is not receptive to you and maybe the hotel is not what you expect it to be and the television broadcast isn't doing what you wanted to do I mean they always have issues with officials we saw that in the Champions League as well and uh, and you just need to be able to overcome not just the opposition there's so many things that you are playing against uh, when you go in, into into playing some of these competitions and I worry about the resources that Bafana Bafana have and and you know we hope that they, they have something because to not get out of the group stage even though maybe that's what we're expecting I think that would be a disaster they have to get out. Okay. Also, say, Alistair, you mind if I come in there? I'm not being rude to you, sir. I will <laughs> for those. The, the, the group is much more difficult than people are giving it uh, when they're looking at it. Tunisia are no rollovers, firstly. Mali have a pedigree of producing, firstly, good footballers, and they are a good team. Okay, Namibia, even with, as you said a bit earlier, with a low population, small country, always give us a difficult time. This is not an easy group. Success for us would be coming out of the group. Anything beyond that would be very positive. What are we going in there with our positives are we've got experienced players who are playing at very good levels, playing consistently. I think we've got a wonderful goalkeeper, a, a, one of the best goalkeepers yeah. we've had in exceptionally long time. 
Uh, Percy Tau continues to be a big hitter on the continent, better than I thought he would be. Moving to um, Al Ahly, I thought he would he would struggle. I really thought, but he. he he did well and then went into a lull and has come back into doing exceptionally well again. Um, I think we got a, a good team. And I think this is what Hugo Bros has to work on. The team dynamic rather than, okay, everything is not great yet. Fantastic. But what is the positive? It is the team. Now you, you've got to break it down in terms of how many games? Seven games. Let's, let's just go out there and give our best for seven games to win this tournament. Mm. That is it. Fredos, I, I know you, you, have to, you have to run, so I'll, I'll, I'll give you a kind of final question. Is On this whole Lyle Foster stuff with, with Hugo Bruce, you know, one of the things you know, from the outside that I really liked about, about Bruce is he's, he's been so clear. He's not yet, like we've said, he, he doesn't pull his punches. He's been very critical of the PSL, calling them out for not giving them time to, to prepare. He's been critical of Safa. But I... For me, I, I want to ask, is this with the Foster stuff a step too far? Because what he's done here is, yes, you know, the decision to, you know, bring Lyle Foster wasn't his. It was ultimately Foster's and Burnley's. But for him, you know, we know South Africa isn't the most, you know, uh, kind of nurturing country when it comes to mental health issues and, and supporting people. And we know that you know, oftentimes the fan bases can be, you know, very vitriolic when, when there's frustrations around players. You know, do you think there's also a sense where actually he could have protected Lyle Foster a bit here? Because we've seen a lot, a lot already on social media, a lot of abuse coming towards Foster, coming towards Bruce as well, but but mainly towards Foster and Burnley. You know, is there a sense that actually he could have communicated this in a way in which he actually protected Lyle a bit more? Because Lyle's not going to be happy. He's not coming to the Afcon, right? Let's let's be clear about that. You know, even if it's his decision, he this is not he's not happy about that. And you know, heaping this pressure and negativity onto him surely can't help. Yeah, it's such an interesting question, Alistair, because my my instinct was to say I think Hugo Bross has done exactly the right thing because we're a country that doesn't talk about mental health enough, especially amongst men and especially amongst uh, men who are not white. I guess so. I, I did. I do think my instinct was to say, yes, absolutely, he should have done it. We need to talk about it. It opens up the conversation. But then when you when you carried on and mentioned that there's been so much social media, just vitriol, which I suppose there always is because, you know, that's what social media tends to be about these days. Then I kind of thought twice and thought, you know, actually, I wonder where the line is between wanting to say, look, here's a discussion point that we need to open up. And then also maybe we just don't want to put this guy in as much of the spotlight and we do want to keep him away from some of, of what people will say. And that is a very tricky thing to balance. My, I really think that we need to discuss these things more. You know, it, as Courtney was saying, there's a level of privilege that comes with being a professional athlete. A financial privilege is probably the biggest one of them. But then, you know, there's also a whole lot of other lifestyle things that Lyle Foster will have that millions, millions, the most of ordinary South Africans will never even be able to touch. And so it's easy to say, well, why can't he just be happy? You know, he's got it all. But we really do need to understand the, the depths of the human mind. We need to understand the pressures that come with that sort of thing. And, and in, I really do think that this is a good way to open up that conversation. And maybe it gets more people talking about it. We're a country with huge mental health problems. There's so much generational trauma. There's so much apartheid created trauma. If we can start to talk about these things, that would be great. I hope that some of the social media stuff starts to, to show a degree of compassion. And I mean, we're talking in an age where the social media companies are owned by narcissists, so probably not. But we do hope that people will start to use this as an opportunity for compassion. I think we, we know what we're getting with the Bavana coach. You know, this is a guy who's going to speak his mind, which is not a bad thing. And uh, I would, you know, we see saw it with Randy Waldrum, sometimes speaking your mind. Uh, is not is not best for your career outcomes. So we'll have to see how he goes um, with the AFCON. And, and I suppose if he comes back with, I think Courtney said, anything beyond getting out of the group stage will be a massive bonus. If he comes back with that sort of bonus, then maybe the, the discourse will change a little bit. So I'm, I'm going to watch the AFCON with a huge amount of interest. And uh, maybe I'll be one of 10 South Africans uh, that will actually be paying attention to the tournament. <laughs> Fredos, thank you so much. We will absolutely be coming back to you and those other 10 South Africans who are, who are interested in the tournament throughout the tournament. Uh, but good luck with, with the cricket you're, you're getting on to, to do. Thanks so much for, for joining us. Thanks, Alistair. Thanks, Courtney, and uh, enjoy the AFCON. Absolutely. Courtney, we've talked about 
you know, the issues with, with, you know, the squad picking in terms of the 23 versus 27, Lyle Foster not be, being in it. But, you know, one of the things that we talked about, about Bruce being very critical is the standard of the PSL and the standard of, of you know, the, the infrastructure, the playing quality, whatever it is. But one of the things that is noticeable about this squad is it's it's a PSL team, isn't it? You know, we, we've seen we've seen a lot of guys who potentially would have gotten into the squad under other coaches playing abroad who aren't, you know, Njabalu Blom and Bongwane both have had excellent seasons in the MLS, not not getting a look in. You know, we have Ingezana, who's, uh, you know, doing really, really well at Stal Bucharest in Romania, not getting a look in. You know, even Fragrai Lakai, who's had an excellent season at Pyramids in Egypt, you know, none of them getting a look in. You know, I thought, I thought Lakai was a bit unlucky not to get in. Yeah, if because be he really stepped it up. Especially with the Lyle Foster situation, you got to mm -hmm. go and look elsewhere. But you know what? you got to you got to, in these moments, back the manager. And that's not a South African way of doing anything. We don't back managers. We create at firing managers. Uh, I won't be surprised if they fire this man halfway through the tournament because <laughs> that's the trend of how South Africa does things. But I will say this to you. I thought uh, Lackey had an opportunity of getting into the team. But Hugo Bross has backed himself. He's taken 23 from the start. He had the opportunity to take 27. I still do feel that he could have taken maybe four under 23 players with the potential of getting in, just being around the squad. But this may come down to financials again. This, these may be his restrictions. Um, I, honestly, Alistair, I, I, I'm, I've never been in this position before. I'm actually quite confident Bafana Bafana will be better than what... Uh, a lot of people are thinking. I, I really do feel that we have a no-nonsense manager who I like, who I've been critical of before because Safa makes sure nobody can speak to this man. He's, he's more secure than the president of the country. Um, because we'd like to get his views on how he's doing things. But I, I'm, I'm quietly confident that we're going to do well. Mm. And, and one of the reasons behind this kind of run of, of, of success up to that Rwanda loss, you know, has been, yes, the performance of, of, of players like, you know, I think particularly Lyle Foster has been excellent for, for Bafana. But the real reality is, is that this team is built up as a core of the Mamelodi Sundowns players. And, you know, Mamelodi Sundowns have been one of the best teams on the continent club-wise. They won the African Football League. They have, you know, in my opinion, the most progressive and exciting African manager in Rulani Mokwena. And they put together a real dynasty there. And this is, you know, the core of the team is is Sundowns players. You know, you, we already mentioned Ron Wynn Williams, terrific goalkeeper. Uh, you know, one of, will definitely be coming into the competition as one of the best. But then you look across the team, Mudam, Vala, Modiba, Mokwena, Yozwane, you know, and then even the players who, who aren't Sundowns players, a lot of them used to be, like Percy Tao. How important is that? Because we talk about, you know, AFCONs and World Cups, you know, and so often we, we dwell on the big players, you know, and in South Africa's case, we'll be thinking about Blom and Fongwane in particular, like these guys are better than these other players. Why aren't they in the squad? But so often, and I brought this quote up so many times, you know, by, you know, and I said we wouldn't bring up the rugby, but Razi Erasmus, and he's, you know, this quote where he says, I don't want the, the, the best players. I want the right players. And that having that cohesion of Sundowns players, that, that team, that core of players who play with each other week in, week out, how much of a difference will that make, do you think, to, to the Bafana team? Firstly, what I what has happened, firstly, I think, you know what, Alistair, good observation, good question. Let's start there. But I agree with you. The players in the PSL have given the national coach a, a dilemma here. The quality has been good. We spoke about Stellenbosch winning trophies. We spoke about Supersport being a, a very competitive outfit. Uh, we've spoken about Orlando Pirates. You and sundowns. Now, all this quality in this league allows the coach to look at plays and think to himself, you know what, I've got a chance to go somewhere and do something with a group of people I select from this collective, which is fantastic. I think having a PSL-based team, is, is it doesn't say it's the right thing, but what it does say, number one, is that the PSL is doing well. There's your first thing. And then also our good PSL players are also going out into Europe and abroad and into America as Njabulo Blom, who's um, in America at the moment, who's also doing well. And imagine he can't get into the team. Imagine a player of that quality who's pulling up trees in America, can't get into the Bafana Bafana squad. How good is our home base players then? 
I think we have a fantastic opportunity, Alistair. Uh, and the manager has good quality at his fingertips to go out there and do an exceptional job. Courtney, I'm, I'm, I'm loving it. A few months ago, I would have, I would have backed, backed you to be negative and miserable like most of the South Africans I know. But now we're hearing confidence, fire, and, and, and aggression and, and belief in this team, which I got to say, with, with, with Bafana, is a rare thing to see. Courtney, thank you so much. We also say thank you to Ferdos, who obviously had to run off early. It's been wonderful being around the Bry again. And hopefully, hopefully, we'll be around the Bry with South Africa, at least in the quarterfinals, semifinals. Who knows? Who knows? Finals. And even winning it, maybe. We don't know. Courtney Freeze, thank you so much once again, as always.